Well, good morning. Welcome to our morning walk with the Apostles for Wednesday, February the 3rd, 2021. Certainly good to be with you this morning. I pray and trust that your day has gotten off to a wonderful start. Uh, it's been a, a good start for our day, or at least for me, here in Hereford. And it's just good to have all of you with us uh, this morning. Uh, don't know exactly where everyone's at. Uh, the good majority, I think, are in this area around Hereford. But I know that at different times we have some listening from uh, further away uh, here in the States. And also, at times, some from overseas, from Scotland, Germany, and even Ukraine. And I just appreciate everyone that's with us each time that we uh, begin or take these few moments each morning. We're going to continue looking at the latter part of Acts chapter 7 this morning, the stoning of Stephen. And before we do that, let's stop and bow for a word of prayer. Father, we continue in our gratitude to you for your blessings in our lives. Again, Father, we thank you for safely keeping us through the night and blessing us with a new day. And we just pray, Father, that this day, as we desire every day, will be used in your service and your to honor and glorify you. I pray, Father, your, your blessings this morning upon us during these few minutes as we reflect upon your word and as we see uh, the death of Stephen, your servant. Father, help us to be encouraged by the things that we read from your word, to be reprimanded when we need to be, but to be strengthened in our faith and in our conviction and our desire to serve. And Father, we just continue to lift up before you those who are dealing with physical difficulties, COVID, cancer, death, whatever it may be. And we pray, Father, that you would bless them and be with them and use us to comfort them. We thank you again for the word that you've given us and for your son Jesus who came and gave his life that we might have life. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, Stephen's defense is found in Acts 7, verses 2 through 53. It's a sermon. We've looked at it in the last couple of, uh, of morning devotionals. In the sermon, Stephen did defend against the accusations made uh, against him. But he also drove home the point that it was not he, but his accusers, who were guilty. Guilty of exactly what they had accused him of. It was they, not he, who needed to repent and return to God. Recall his stirring conclusion, chapter 7, verses 51 to 53. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. When Stephen spoke these words, he knew the risk he was taking. His words could result in revival or rejection, deliverance or death, salvation or stoning. There was no revival. Verse 54 notes, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick. Now the phrase, cut to the quick, is the same one that we found in chapter 5, verse 33, when the council was ready to kill the apostles before Gamaliel intervened. It literally means their hearts were sawn as with a ripsaw. Instead of repenting of their sins, 
The latter part of verse 54 says in the New International Version, they were furious and they began gnashing their teeth at him. In their anger, they clenched their jaws so hard that their teeth ground against each other. This time, no Gamaliel spoke up to cool the flames of hatred. As Stephen looked around at the maddening crowd, or the maddened crowd, he must have known that death was near. It was a significant moment, not only on earth, but also in heaven, when God gave Stephen a special vision to sustain him. The ugly faces, filled with hate, faded from Stephen's view. Instead, a beautiful face filled with love flooded his sight. Look at verse 55. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, when Jesus had returned to heaven, he sat down at the right hand of God. Mark 16, verse 19. See also Psalm 110, verses 1 and 4. And Hebrews 1, verse 13. And Hebrews 8, verses 1 and 2. Now, however, he stood out of respect for this one who was willing to die for his faith. Stephen said in verse 56, Behold, I see the heavens opened up, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. During Jesus' trial, the high priest had asked, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus had replied, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. Now at that point, the high priest had torn his robe, crying, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. That's in Mark 14, verses 61 to 63. If Jesus had been guilty of blasphemy for claiming he would be at the right hand of God, Stephen had to be guilty of blasphemy for saying that Jesus was at the right hand of God. Stephen's claim to see Jesus was the last straw. Yelling at the top of their voices, the NIV says, the distinguished council members in their judicial robes covered their ears with their hands to, to shut out Stephen's infuriating words and rushed upon him with one impulse. Acts 7.57 This is roughly the equivalent of to the United States Supreme Court uh, justices, leaping from their seats, pulling automatic weapons uh, from, in their, uh, from their black robes and gunning down the defendant before them. It would be a scene hard to believe if an inspired man had not said that it happened. What occurred next was illegal, both by Jewish law and Roman law. It was probably how the apostles would have been treated earlier if Gamaliel had not calmed the council. The beginning of verse 58 says, And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. Unable to silence Stephen, 
they lied against him. Unable to answer him, they killed him. And thus has error always responded to the truth. Some semblance of legality was preserved in the proceeding, however. Stephen had been accused of blasphemy, and the penalty for blasphemy was stoning. Look at Leviticus 24, verses 10 through 23. Deuteronomy 13, verses 6 through 11. Therefore, the council stoned him. Jewish tradition says that the death penalty was not to be administered inside the city of Jerusalem. And so they drove him outside Jerusalem. Note 1 Kings 21.13 Those who had witnessed against the condemned man were to cast the first stones. Deuteronomy 17.7 7. And thus we read, And the witnesses laid aside their robes. Acts 7.58b So their arms were free for throwing. Acts 7.58c says that they laid their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now this is the first time we read about Saul, later known as Paul. But we have suggested in our devotionals that he was probably involved in the debate with, Caesar, uh, with Stephen in the Hellenistic synagogue. He was doubtless present in the council for Stephen's trial and was probably among those who rushed like savage beasts on Stephen. In Acts 8.1, we read that Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. Later, in a prayer, Paul himself would say, quote, And when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I also was standing by approving and watching uh, and watching out for the cloaks of those who were slaying him. Acts 22, verse 20. Why did the witnesses entrust their garments to Saul and not someone else? Perhaps this indicates that Saul was in charge of the execution. Perhaps it was a mere coincidence. We cannot know for certain why the witnesses put their robes at Saul's feet. But we can guess why Luke shared that detail with us to show how Saul was involved and why every detail was burned indelibly on his mind. Again, see Acts 22.20 and compare 1 Timothy 1 verse 13. Stoning was a terrible way to die. If the council took Stephen to the official place of stoning, they threw him off a cliff, rolled boulders down to crush him, and then pelted him with large stones until the breath left his body his battered and broken body. Since this was a mob action, they may simply have surrounded him and begun hurling rocks along with their curses. In the middle of every whirling hurricane, there is an eye where all is calm. Surrounded by swirling hatred, Stephen was at peace. His final moments are recorded in Acts 7, verses 59 and 60. 
They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. How could Stephen die with a prayer on his lips for his murderers? Well, he had imbibed the spirit of him who prayed on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Luke 23, 34. And the one who then trusted his soul to God. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Luke 23, verse 46. Saul could never erase this scene from his mind. Augustine would later suggest, quote, the church owes the preaching of Paul to the prayer of Stephen, end quote. For the moment, however, frenzied by the blood of Stephen, Saul became a wild animal set on destroying the church. Immediately following the account of Stephen's death, we read in chapter 8, verse 1b, and then verse 3, and on that day, a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem. And Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Tomorrow, we'll move into chapter 8 and see more about what Luke records of the reaction of the Jerusalem Christians to the stoning death of Stephen. Let's close our time this morning with another prayer. Loving Father, I thank you for the record of Stephen's standing for the truth of the gospel, speaking boldly of his faith in your Son. And while, Father, it's tragic that he lost his physical life, we do know and recognize that he gained a spiritual victory. Father, I don't know if any of us will ever stand in a similar situation as Stephen, But I pray that if we do, that we'll face it with the same strength of faith, courage of conviction, and boldness to speak that Stephen did. Even if it means we lose our physical lives. I pray, Father, that this event encourages and strengthens us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, you go out and you make your Wednesday a great day. I want to remind you of our Wednesday evening devotional time at 7.30 here in our uh, auditorium this evening. We'll be singing praises and going before the Father in prayer 
and then one of our men will be speaking in a devotional uh, from God's Word. We'll be live here in the auditorium, uh, in person, or if you can join us on Facebook. That's this evening at 7.30. And then, Lord willing, we'll be back tomorrow at 10 o'clock with another morning walk with the Apostles. I pray that you can be with us at that time.